Lord, let that be our prayer, that he sets us on fire.
He's listening. He's listening. He's listening. He is worthy. He is worthy. I think we need to keep singing this for a few minutes. We're going to give you his praise. We're going to give him 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 his praise. with us, 
we're talking about how we tend in our lives to ghost God. Now, we said last week you can't ghost God because God is everywhere present. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. So you can't ghost him. But we think that we can ghost him. And so this series is not only about uh, relationships with one another, but it's more about our relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's more about our relationship with God. And we're coming to realize that God wants to speak to us. And some people literally live their lives as if God does not exist. They're ghosting God. Some people believe in him, but don't talk to him. Some, some people, they hear him, but they don't listen and obey what it is that he has to say. They turn his voice down. And some people actually, and it's very, very sad when it happens, but completely cut him out of their lives. And so tonight we're talking about uh, this idea of how we don't want to do that in our relationship with God. Last week we said that the Holy Spirit is our friend. He's our helper. He, he's good. And, and that Jesus actually said that it was a good thing that he was going back to be with the Father because when he went back to be with the Father, he was going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, in John chapter 16, Jesus says, The Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. How much truth will he guide you into? All truth. Circle that. It's all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. It's important that we learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're talking about tonight. You say, why is it important, Pastor Mike? It's important because the Holy Spirit of God will never, ever, ever lead you astray. The Holy Spirit of God will never, ever lead you away from Jesus. And listen, if you're on a, on a walk, on a path right now, away from Jesus, know that the Holy Spirit of God is desperately texting you. He's trying to tell you to come back. He's always going to lead us closer to Jesus. He's never going to ask us to do something that's contrary to his word and his will. He's always asking us to move closer to his will. He shows us the things to come. He reveals to us the path that we're on. He shows us the victory that we can have in Him. He shows us the power that we have to overcome temptations and sin. Come on, the Holy Spirit is your helper. He's your friend. He's your advocate. He's God. He's not an it. He's not some sort of big, fluffy cloud that just kind of floats around. He's God, the Holy Spirit, and he wants to get to know you. And that's what we're talking about. Last week we said the Holy Spirit of God is texting us, and it was time to reply when he texts us. Tonight we're saying, listen, don't ghost the Holy Ghost, man. Don't, don't do it. Do not do it. Don't turn his voice down. So I want to build on that foundation that we, we spoke about last, last week. And if you're a Christian here tonight, if you, if you love Jesus with all your heart, say amen. 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 All right. And remember, we're making amen great again. Amen. Right? So we want to make amen great by saying amen. When you, say, when you hear something that you like and you agree with, you say amen. When you hear something that you don't like but you know it's true, you say amen. amen. You may not like it. Come on. You know it's true. You don't like everything in the Bible, do you? Amen. <laughs> amen. But if you're here tonight, if you're watching online and you have a relationship with God, you, you, you've been saved, you've been set free, you've been born again, that means you've been yeah. made new. We just sang that song, I'm made new, right? That means the Holy Spirit of God is living inside of you. Do you realize what that means? God lives inside of you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Man, we're going to talk more about that next week. Listen, this message was so long, I had to cut it in half. You only get half of what. Well, next week, we're going to talk about the other half. I haven't gotten this half yet, so hold on. <laughs> I know you can't wait to dive in, neither can I. So if you're a Christian, that's what that means. If you're not a Christian, and we know that not everybody that comes to church is a Christian. We know that not everybody that watches is a Christian. And we're so glad you're here. And our 
prayer is that you will make Christ the Lord of your life. That's our, that's our prayer for everybody. But if you're, if you're not in that category, then you need to know that the Holy Spirit of God wants to lead you into a relationship with God. The Holy Spirit of God wants to keep the Christian in a relationship and walking the right way, and He wants to get the non-Christian to start walking uh, and, and following Christ. That's His job. That's what He does. And so whether you're a Christian or you're or not Christian, non-Christian, the idea here is, are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Are you listening? Are you turning down His voice? Walking. Walking is the theme of this portion of, of Ephesians. You're going to notice it in the, in the language. Walking is the theme. And so we're going to spend two weeks this week and next week talking about walking. Some of you can't walk and talk, right? And today, tonight, we're going to talk and walk. Verse 17, Ephesians 4. I'm going to read to you verse 17 through 19, and then I'm going to pray. This is, this I say, it's Apostle Paul talking. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Ooh, that's a message right there. You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. What does that mean? What does Gentile mean here? It means non-believer. You, you, believer, should no longer walk or live your life the way that a non-believer lives their life and walk. That's what he's saying. This is the new King Jimmy, so we got to break it down a little bit, right? This is this I say, therefore, and to testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Verse 20. You know, we love the butts of the Bible. This is a great butt right here, right? But you, everybody say, but you. But you. Have not so learned Christ. In other words, that's not what you were taught. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's got to help us with this message tonight. And let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your spirit here. Lord, your word is sharp. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces into the depths of our hearts. God, in the book of Jeremiah, your word is described as a hammer and a fire. May it be a hammer and a fire tonight, Lord. May we be moldable and teachable. And may we not turn down the voice of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight's, tonight's message is called, Hey! You're going the wrong way. Hey! Exclamation. You're going the wrong way. I've got one point and three sub points for you, and we're out of here. You're eating. You're eating Chinese food right after this. <laughs> also, the talk over, you have a talk over with you? There's a portion where you can fill in the blanks. It keeps you awake, so I don't bore if I bore you, you can just write it in. So the first fill in the blanks for your notes is this. Put off the old walk. That's what Paul's saying. Put off the old walk. Listen to what he says. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Now, if we have a relationship with Jesus, if we have a relationship with him, we're saved, then this is the old you. The old walk, it represents the old you. This is the old me. This is a picture of my old life, your old life. Before Christ, before you were found, before you were, you were lost, but now you are found. This is a picture, if you will, of the old path that I was one time and that you were one time walking. And if you don't know Jesus, I just want to say it. This is the path that you're on right now. This is the path that you're on. This is what Paul calls the old walk. Now, I want to just ask you a question. Have you ever seen a picture of yourself that you don't like? Yes, ladies, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Because, it, guys, you got to help me out here because I'm going to get in 
in trouble if I know. When you take a picture of your wife, right, the how many times do you have to, it has to be pre-approved before it can be posted, right? And did you know that your wife has a side that she likes? Did you know that? If you don't know that, this is going to help your marriage right now, all right? Listen, your wife has a favorite side, and the side that she likes is the side that she always talks do not, and I've learned from experience, do not try to put her on the other side. She doesn't like that side. I, I've said to my wife many times, I like, uh, I like every side of you. It doesn't matter what I like. If we're taking the picture, she wants it on her side. You'll notice in anything that I post, she's always on a certain side. It's her favorite side. It's the side that she thinks that she looks the best. Have you ever taken a picture and said, do I really look like that? Right? I mean, right? Do I, the, it was the lighting wrong? Right? Um, did, 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 did I really gain that much weight over the pandemic? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now the picture, the picture in and of itself, although you do not like it, is it true? Yes, the picture is true. Ain't nobody trying to put a filter. That's why we have filters, because the picture's true. I'm not going to get a lot of amens about that. You want to filter out your flaws. You don't want everyone to see your flaws. And so when we look at our old walk, it's a true picture of who we used to be before Christ. It's a true picture of where you might be right now. And for some people, quite honestly... You don't want to deal with it. You don't want to look at it. You want to try to sweep it under the rug. You want to try to put some filter on it. God is asking you tonight to deal with it. Let's dig a little deeper in the, on this subject. Because you might be thinking, hey, you know, what's the big deal? I don't have a problem with my life. I like my life apart from Christ. I like, I like, I like calling all my own shots. And if that's you tonight, I would say, well, okay, I was there once too. I understand what you're saying. And the Holy Spirit's trying to get our attention. And all I'm doing tonight is begging you. I'm just begging you as a pastor. I'm begging you as a pastor not to take offense to the things that I'm about to say. Because I'm only reading the text. And I don't want you to take offense to it. But I, I ask you, to listen, weigh it out in your spirit. Well, what's he saying? What's he saying? Let's look at it. Let's look at it. Life apart from Jesus. A life on the old walk. A life that's separated from Christ is aimless. Write that down. It's aimless. A life apart from Jesus or the old you is Aimless. Paul says that it's futile thinking. It's, it's empty thinking. In other words, when you're not walking with Jesus, you're walking with the world. You're, you can't walk with Jesus and walk with the world. You can't be on two separate paths at the same time. You're either on one path or the other. You're walking with Jesus or you're walking with the world. Doing what the world does. Satisfying yourself however you want to. Following whatever rules you want to follow. Just kind of wandering aimlessly through life. you got no real purpose. You've got no real direction. You're busy, yes. you got plans and things to do, but you're not really going anywhere. You're wondering, is there, there's got to be more to life than this. Do you remember feeling that way? That there's got to be more to life than this. And you're on this road aimlessly wandering around, just kind of living life. Just kind of living around and, and trying everything that there is to try, but still not being satisfied. Still saying, I need more. I want more. I need more money, right? I need more time. I, I, need, I need more, more, more. We're never, ever satisfied. There's always something more that we need. 
And King Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived, he had everything that you could ever imagine on this earth. He had money. He had women. He had success. He had power. He had everything. And yet, he writes this in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 2 and 14 says, everything is meaningless. What? Without God, everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. He says, I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. Have you ever tried to chase after a bubble as it's passing by? You see little kids chasing the bubbles in the wind? And they get so disappointed when they reach that bubble and it pops. <laughs> I mean, I kind of think it's funny. I do that all the time. It's like, they, they try to catch it. That's what your life without Jesus is like. You see, all of us have a hole in our soul. We have a, a hole in our soul that can't be filled with things that, of this world. It cannot satisfy. And our life apart from Jesus is empty. And it's aimless. And nobody's telling you that. Everybody's telling you to do you. But the Holy Spirit said, no, you can't do you. You can't do you. You're looking for meaning, and you're looking for purpose, and it's, it's like catching air without Christ. Do you remember? Do you remember feeling that way? If you're saved, do you remember feeling that way? How many people do you know right now at work, at school, in your family? How many people do you know right now that they're just not excited about their life? They complain all the time. They're not happy with who they are. They're not happy with the job they have. The person that they're married to. They complain. They, 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 they're not happy in the direction that they're going. And guess what? Ten years ago, they were in the same place. And ten years before that, they were in the same place. Do you remember being like that? Non-Christian. Before you were before, Christian, before you were uh, saved. Do you remember that? How many people do you know right now? How many can you count on your hand that are genuinely happy in life? That have joy? And I know a lot of people are unhappy and they're dissatisfied with their life. But I can't count too many people that have joy. Did you know that we, were, we had a meeting with the River Bay Corporation two weeks ago and they told us that over this pandemic, the suicide rate in Co-op City has gone way up. The suicide, in other words, people are, have no hope. The pandemic, the violence, the racism, the, the racial tensions, they're out of work. Their loved ones are dying. People feel like they have no hope. And so why not just end it all? That's the message of the world. Hey, listen, if you can't deal with it, just, just end it. That's what people think. And I want to say, that's the devil lying to you. Amen. That's the devil lying to you. There's hope, and his name is Jesus Christ. Yeah. There's hope. You can find joy, and you can find satisfaction, not from this world, not from anything that this world can give you, but in a person, and his name is Jesus, and he's trying to get your attention. Listen, I, I, I'm not just saying this to you. I'm living this. I'm living this right now. I'm living this. My life's not perfect. A lot of people think that pastors, you know, walk around in a perpetual state of holiness. They get out of bed and just kind of hover over. Like, oh. No, you don't see me in the morning all jacked up, hair all over the place, limping because my hamstring hurts. Bumping into stuff, complaining I gotta walk the dog and then pick up his stuff. You don't see that part of me, you just see this part. Oh, I wish I could have a walk like Pastor Mike. Listen, my walk is like your walk. It's one day at a time, one step in front of the other. But even with issues, and I've got plenty of them, listen, i got a joy in my heart, and his name is Jesus. i got a satisfaction in my heart, and his name is Jesus. And my life is an adventure, man, I'm telling you. I never know where God's going to take me next. And I'm living it. And just like you, you know what? Just 
trust in the one who holds tomorrow in his hands. And that's the difference. Psalm 119 tells me that God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And the Holy Spirit of God is leading me, walking with me. He's helping me. He's guiding me. He's giving me divine direction. He's showing me how to walk in God's purposes and plan for my life. And that's what he wants to do for you too. Apart from Jesus, you are just wandering around this earth. Pointless. That's what that devil is telling you. But I'm telling you, God's got a direction for your life. Yes, that's it. And you need to turn up the Holy Spirit of God. Mark Twain once wrote, the two most important days in your life are the day that you were born and the day that you find out why. Yeah, that's it. The two most important days in your life, the day you were born and the day that you found out why. Let me ask you a question. Do you know why you're here? Have you discovered your purpose? You see, we're all worried about the how. How can my life have meaning in a world like this? How can my life be worth anything? How can I make it through another day? But listen, when we find the why, Jesus gets us through the how. Come on. Yeah. We, Jesus is the why. When we find the purpose, Jesus gets us through the how. My own life was aimless. It had no direction. And some of you right now, you feel like your life has no direction. And it wasn't until I listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit that it began to make sense to me. And all of the dots started to get connected. You may be thinking, well, that's great for you. Good for you. Maybe you're watching right now. That's good for you. But I don't see things that way. Okay? Okay. You might say, I don't see anything wrong with my life. I like my life. I'm not trying to try to end my life. I like my life. Okay. You don't see anything wrong with that. That leads me to point number two. Life apart from Jesus is aimless, but life apart from Jesus is also sightless. Sightless. Paul's saying what he... Yeah, Paul must have been from the Bronx. <laughs> Because Paul's just saying it the way it is. You know what Paul's saying here? He's saying you're blind. You see, you don't see things that way because you're blind. That's what he's saying. Look at what he said. Verse 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness in their hearts. You don't see it because you're blind. You know, us New Yorkers, when we go upstate, there's a whole new world up there. We're used to the glow of the city, all the lights. But when you drive two, three, four, five hours upstate, and you get out of some of those roads, do you ever notice how dark it is? Even with the high beams on, you're kind of afraid. Every scary movie that you've ever seen in your life starts to kind of come back to you. In that moment, don't take a wrong turn. <laughs> don't go to the house. A few years back, my sons went up to stay with my sister. <laughs> and she lives five and a half hours from here, upstate. <clears throat> they had been in the city for three, four years and kind of used to what's going on. They forgot what it's like up there. She lives in rural upstate. No lights. There's not, even a, there's not even a stop sign or a traffic light in her town. There's a post office. That's it. A post office and a store. In fact, it just says store. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So one night, about this time of night, I get a call from my teenage son. Dad. Dad. It's so dark here. I said, you're going to be all right. And then he's like, but Grandpa's making us go to bed now. I'm like, it's only 8.30. I know, he's old. That's why he's doing that. I'll turn the TV on. He's, he's in the living room with us. He won't let us. And everything was so dark, all they could hear was the wind. 
and the crickets. And so I literally had to stay on the phone with my two boys, teenage boys, until the fear went away. That's dark. That's being in a dark place. And listen, when we were walking our old walk, or maybe the walk you're on right now, that's the kind of dark place you're in. You just don't see it. You're blinded to it. Your understanding is darkened. You could, you could see it if the Holy Spirit opened your eyes, but you're not listening to him. If you're here without Christ, you think everything's okay, but you're in a dark, dark place. And you can't even tell. Did you know that the devil himself blinds the eyes? Blinds our eyes. He blinds the eyes of the unbeliever. I don't believe in that. Well, that's because you're blind. Look at 2 Corinthians. And even if our gospel is veiled, covered, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In other words, they don't have Christ. The God, look at the little G, that's, that's Satan. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this age is the devil, and his main goal is to keep you blind. That's what he does. And so listen, if you're watching or you're here tonight, you're like, I don't believe in all that hocus pocus stuff. You actually believe in the devil, you know, with horns and hell and all that. I don't believe in that. Listen, you're helping, you're making his job much easier. Because, because you're deceived, and because you can't see, all you got to do is keep blindly walking down the road you're on, and he's got you. He's got you. Now, when was the last time you heard a message like that? When was the last time you were warned like that? I don't believe in the devil. Well, guess what? He believes in you, and he hates you. Jesus said that the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. He's a, ma he's a master at deception. When you go back to Genesis chapter 3, he took all of humanity captive with a lie. And we're still paying the price for that today. So go ahead. You can say, I don't believe him. But I would just say, what Paul is saying, what the Spirit is saying is, it's because he's keeping you blind and deceived. People say, oh, there's many ways to God. Jesus isn't the only way. You think that because you're blind. You can't see. Pick a way. Just, just pick any way and be happy with your life. No, you think that because you're blind. Oh, people say, you can't believe this. You can't believe the Bible. The Bible was written by people. You can't believe that. that's not really God's word. You believe that because you're blind. And guess what? The devil has you so tripped up about which version you're supposed to use, you're not even reading any of it. And it's the authorized, spiritual, right? Everything that we need to get through this life, word of God, true. But you don't believe it because you believe that somebody else wrote it. Well, who do you think wrote your textbooks? Somebody else. Do you believe what's in there? Yeah. Interesting. Why? Because you're blind. Because you're deceived. Because the devil blinds you. And he keeps you deceived. And, and when we're separated from Jesus, we actually lack the ability to understand the things of God. It's foolishness to people. Oh, you believe in Jesus? Oh, you're, you're going to church and you go to Bible study and you pray? Man, I feel sorry for you. They don't understand it. It's foolishness to them. Paul puts it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But the natural man, that's the people without Jesus, the natural, natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are what? Foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. There's people here that are, there's people that are watching out here that are blinded by religion. Blinded by religion. Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3. And he was very, very religious. And yet he was very, very lost. 
And Jesus said that you have to be born again to get into the kingdom of heaven. That the spirit of God blows like the wind. And there was he was in such a such a uh, staunch religion that told him when to get up and when to sit down and when to pray and what to eat that he could not see the glory of God. His eyes were blinded until Jesus opened them. Yeah. Religion will keep. The devil loves religion. He loves that you're spiritual. Oh, that's a great word these days. Let's get together and be spiritual. Well, you know, the devil can be spiritual. He is spiritual after all. But you need a relationship with God. Have you ever noticed that unsaved people don't understand your walk with God? Have you ever tried to talk to somebody and explain your relationship with Jesus and they look at you like you've got a third eye? They don't get it. You talk to them and they nod their head, but you know they don't understand. They never develop a hunger and a thirst for the word of God, even though they see your walk, even though they see the change in you, even though they see the light in you, even though they listen to your testimony, even though they go to church with you. It's like the, the light is never on, it's always dark. They don't understand it. When we're trying to describe our relationship with Jesus, it's like trying to describe what a beautiful sunset looks to a blind person. It's like trying to be all the description of all the beautiful colors of the sunset to a person that was born blind and has no capability of understanding. That's what Jesus does for us. He opens our eyes. So we're blind. But this text it actually goes a little bit deeper because there's another level of blindness that Paul's talking about here. Not just the blind because you've been blinded by the devil blind, but there's also another blindness that every believer in Christ has to be careful of. And that is a willing rejection to the truth of God. I know it's a tough message. I labored and struggled with it all week. I wanted to give you something happy. Amen. <laughs> the text also talks about a willing rejection in, in, in some people to the truth of God's word. They don't believe this is God's word. They don't believe they need to be saved. They don't believe Jesus is the only way. They don't, they don't, they'll say, don't push your religion on me. I'm not a religious person. Their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardening of their hearts. It's so great that we have our missionary to the college campus over here yeah. tonight. Let's, say, let's thank her for being here tonight. Yeah. She's got a birthday coming up. Yeah. I read a story this week about a missionary on a college campus, just like Jasmine Santos. Missionary on a college campus, and she was being picked on by some of the other students because she was known as the Christian one. That Christian. I'm not talking about Jasmine, but I'm using her as an example. What I'm saying is you can look at her and go, oh, I feel so bad for her. <laughs> and, they, and they would constantly say, you actually believe the Bible is true? You actually believe in stuff like hell? You believe that's real? And that Jesus is the savior of the world? And then one day, as she had her table out there and her, her information for her club, uh, another student uh, who considered himself to be not only smart but an atheist, he came up to her and, and he said, I, wanna, I have a simple question for you. Have you ever audibly heard the voice of God? The girl said, no. He said, have you ever touched God, like physically touched him or felt him? She said, no. Have you ever smelled him? She said, no, that's weird. <laughs> the boy, he laughed at her and he said, he said, how can you believe in something that you've never seen, heard, touched, tasted, or smelled? How can you believe in a God that you can't see or feel with your senses? And so she looked at him and she said, okay, I have a simple question for you. 
Have you ever seen your brain? <laughs> no. Have you ever felt your brain? No. Have you ever smelled your brain? <laughs> no. Well, how do you know that you really have a brain? <laughs> how do you know? Life apart from God, aimless, and it's sightless. And the Holy Spirit of God wants to shine the light of Jesus into your life to open up your eyes. And it's not, right now it's time not to go to the Holy Ghost. You're going the wrong way. So our life apart is aimless, it's sightless. And the last one for your notes is this. It's, it's shameless. Life without God has no meaning. It has no purpose. Life without God keeps you in the dark. Spiritually, you can't see it, but it's there. And life without God is shameless. Now listen to this. This is a warning to us. Listen. Uh, verse 19. Who being past feeling, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. There's a lot of misses there. Lewdness with uncleanliness with greediness. Did you ever notice that even before Christ, in your life, there were certain sins, certain things that you did, that when you did them, you knew in your heart they were wrong? Like you didn't need a preacher to tell you that was wrong. You knew in your heart, ooh, there's something, that, that kind of stung a little bit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Say amen if you do. Yeah. Amen. You know what that is? That's our God-given conscience. Just that little voice, just that little heads up, hey, by the way, that's, that's God speaking to us, that through the conscience, letting us know that that was wrong, that that was sin. We don't like that word. That was sin. That's the Holy Spirit saying, evangelist, great comfort, calls the conscience the inbuilt judge in the courtroom of your mind. Your conscience, everybody's got one. Doesn't matter what culture you grew up in, everybody has a conscience. Everybody knows. Certain things, right or wrong, that your conscience will, will tell you you're guilty on. And the thing about the conscience is, is it only speaks to us about moral things. Did you ever notice your conscience never lets you know that you're wearing odd socks? <laughs> like your conscience doesn't go off on you, oh, your socks are odd. Now maybe you, you, know, you feel kind of way, some kind of way if you have odd socks. But your conscience doesn't kick in and go, man, you're wearing odd socks. But your conscience will kick in if you steal socks. Mm -hmm. Even if they're odd. Mm -hmm. Even if you take them. Your conscience will kick in. So it's not going to, it's your conscience isn't going to kick in if you like the Jets <laughs> or the Giants, who are equally horrible this year. But your conscience will kick in if you steal somebody's tickets to the game. That's, the con that's what the conscience does. And God gave that to us. And, that's, and, and so our conscience works kind of like a judge in the courtroom of our mind. And our social surroundings, they, they, they can shape our conscience, but they didn't create our conscience. God created that conscience. And here's why. Because people say, what about people out in the jungle that never heard about Jesus? What's going to happen to them? Well, God gave them a conscience. And if a missionary never gets out to them in their heart and between the conscience and be between everything that's been created, it points to a creator. Yeah. And so we are without, we know what this means, we're without excuse. You will not stand before a holy God on judgment day and say, I didn't know about you. Because your conscience will call you a liar. That's why God did it. Yeah. Why? Because he loves you. Because he's trying to get your attention. Because he wants a relationship with you. And so our conscience kind of kicks in. And when we go against our conscience enough, because all of you know what that's like, because I know what it's like. You do something, conscience kicks in, eh. Do something, conscience kicks in, eh. You do something, conscience kicks in, you don't feel it anymore. Why? Because... Paul just said that you've become beyond feeling. In other words, your conscience, God forbid, listen, you've got to hear me. God 
forbid that your conscience would ever be beyond feeling. Because it could be too late for you. Like you could sit in church week after week after week and hear the truth. Turn it down and harden your hearts to the point where it will not penetrate anymore. God forbid. God forbid. We go against it. The idea of being of our conscience is past feeling means that we start to rationalize things. Listen, Paul calls it lewdness. What do you rationalize? Lewdness. It's one of the first things. Lewdness. It sounds kind of King James, doesn't it? The NIV calls it sensuality. Because like it or not, since the beginning of time, mankind has had a problem with sensuality. Sensuality, that sounds much more pointed. The Greek word is asle, asle, aselgia, I can't say it. Darn it, I had it this morning. <laughs> you know what it means? It means an unbridled lust, excess, licentious, shame, shamelessness, and sensuality. And that's how our world has always been. And so God's what Paul is saying, what the Spirit is saying through Paul, is that when we, when our conscience is seared, when our hearts become hardened, the first thing that we think is okay is sensuality. In the Old Testament, sensuality was one of the things that the non-believing world was completely known for. Sexual immorality, infidelity, fornication, adultery. It's always been a problem. It's not just a problem now. It's always been a problem. It was such a big deal that God put it in his top ten not to do it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't, don't do it. Don't commit it. Yet when Israel was surrounded by all the ungodly nations, those nations, get this, as part of their worship, would go up to the temple and have sex with temple prostitutes as part of their worship. And Israel was surrounded by all of these kinds of, of, of nations, and this actually tempted the children of Israel so much, they were like, well, that's a different way to have church. We don't have church that way. Maybe I'll try to go to that church. And that's what they did. That's what they did. They thought they were missing out. Why? Because the devil blinds you and he deceives you and your heart is desperately wicked and will go with the flow. And if you turn down the voice of the Holy Spirit enough, then you will become blinded and your heart will be seared to this. Fast forward to Jesus' time. Jesus raised the bar on adultery. He said, you've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in their hearts. That goes for the ladies too. He kicks it up a notch. Then Paul comes along. Now he's writing to believers who were raised in a totally Roman Greco period in a culture that believed that sex is fine. It's just another act. It's like eating, drinking, and going to sleep. That's what sex is. So if you need to do it, do it. Doesn't that sound familiar? Hey, if you're going to do it, we're going to give you some condoms for it. If you're going to do it, we're going to give you a pill afterwards just in case. We're going to, instead of saying, no, you should wait because that's God's design, we're just saying, here you go, here you go, here you go, here you go. Have fun, boys. Have fun. Because we're blind and we're deceived. And the world has not changed. And neither have we. And we, we, become, we become desensitized to it. I got my physical this past week. There's a big bucket of condoms right there. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? Oh, it's just something that you do. It's normal. It's normal for the world. Hear me. 
It's normal for the world. Mm -hmm. I can't get upset with the world for doing things that worldly people do. Paul says that's part of your old life. If you're made new in Christ, this is your new life. It's time to raise the bar. It's time to raise the bar because it's in your shows. It's in your music. It's, it's in your schools. It's, it's, it's drag, drag queen story time hour in, in preschool. It's showing, it's, it's talking about, talking to little children about how they can have sex. It's cutie. It's a show about ped pedophiles on Netflix. And we're just like, okay, okay, yeah, okay. And what the Holy Spirit is saying, enough is enough. That's what you used to be like. That's what you used to do. That's what you used to be into. And people are addicted. Christian people addicted to pornography. Followers of Jesus, love God, addicted to sex. And the world will say, it's no big deal. You just keep doing you. It's normal. But the God who created this world, the God who died for this world, the God who's coming back for us, the God who's coming back to judge this world is saying, no, it's not the normal. It's not what I want for you. Listen, you were ignorant of those things before, but God's speaking to you right now, and you're on the wrong road. Hey, you're going the wrong way. Some of you are running down it. You're running down at full speed ahead and you do not see the car coming. Hear his voice. Don't ghost the Holy Ghost. If the worship team can come back up, I'm about yelling myself out. <laughs> Are you getting this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You, stop, you stand up there pointing your finger at me, Pastor Mike. No, 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 no. Listen, and there by the grace of God, go I. I'm just like you. I got to make decisions every day to walk with Jesus, to listen to his voice. And I have to make decisions not to go to the Holy Ghost. I want to leave you with this last Scripture verse. Let's do come from the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. So, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Would you stand with me, please? I can't tell you how I've been praying for you during these 21 days of, you know, we're on day seven. And all week, the Holy Spirit has been specifically speaking to my heart about praying and interceding. That those that are stuck in darkness would, would see a great light. And it wouldn't be a religious light would be a relational light. Be the light of Christ. That those that are on the wrong road and think that they're okay and kind of just laugh at what we're talking about tonight. That God would have grace and mercy on their lives even one more day. And I would say to you tonight, and I'm begging you, I'm begging you as a pastor. I have friends and family that don't know the Lord. I have friends and family that ghost me because of my relationship with the Lord. And I don't take offense to that because Jesus said if they hate me, they're not going to like you either. And if you're following Jesus, you're going to look different. You're going to. And if you don't, then tonight you need to ask why. 
Maybe that's the question that the Holy Spirit has for you tonight is, do you really love me? Do you love me enough to follow me? Do you love me enough to let me lead you? And here's the bottom line. And we miss it because we just think, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. But do you realize the depth of love that God has for you? With everything that I've done, and I just turned 50 this year, I did a lot. And my, my plate is full of all the bad things, really. And yet I still find ways to have, have, have pour, pour, pile some more on. But the grace and the mercy of God. Because he loves you. And he has a purpose for you. And he has a plan for you. And he wants to make you new. And he's tired of seeing you walk aimlessly around. He wants you to have a new walk. He wants you to have a new talk. And we'll talk more about that new walk next week. But right now I'm pleading with you to ask yourself the question, what's the Holy Spirit saying to me? And I'm asking that you wouldn't shut this off or turn it off or turn it down. But you would allow yourself to do something we do not like, which is to feel the conviction. Spirit's job. And so he, if he's speaking to you right now, if he's speaking to you right now, feel his conviction. And it's not too late for you to turn his voice up. Don't turn it down. Turn it up. Because the Holy Spirit's texting you. Some of you could be, you need to turn back to him today. For some of you, maybe you need to turn to him for the first time. As the Holy Spirit begins to minister to you and talk to you in your, in your place, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, you're watching this, or you're here tonight, you would say, I do not have a relationship with Jesus. My life is looks exactly like everybody else's when I want that relationship. I hear his voice. If that's you, just repeat after me because that's the Holy Spirit. He's drawing you to Christ. He's drawing you to Christ. And the way to Christ, John says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, will be saved. That's what we do. So if you feel that way tonight, just lift your hands to heaven. Father God, speak to our hearts. We stand here in your presence. Not perfect, but you already knew that. And yet you loved us anyway. Lord, I pray that as your Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, those, Lord, that are stuck in a perpetual state of spiritual blindness would find the light of Christ even right now. That that darkness would be shattered. Pray, Lord God, for the to unveil our eyes that that which we thought was foolishness would become the wisest and most important thing that we could ever do. Is to trust you as Lord and Savior of our lives. And Lord, for those of us that are here tonight, that have a walk with you, Lord, I pray our walk would be a little stronger tonight, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that over these 21 days, Lord God, and seven are already done just like that. I pray, Lord, over these next Two weeks, Lord God, as we're pressing in, Lord, that every lie, every deception of the enemy, Lord God, would, would be 
busted up by the truth of who you are, Lord God. That bondages would fall. That addictions would fall, Lord God. That the dark witness that's inside of our hearts would be exposed to the light of God. And that people, Lord God, would be set free. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And amen. We're going to say, close our worship time and you are uh, free to go. I'm going to pray for the offering. And if don't forget, today is Mission Sunday. So we're going to finish our worship time just spending a few moments with the Holy Spirit. You may leave after this. Uh, you go ahead. And as soon as I say go, you want to go, go. Uh, Pastor Cindy's right over there if you have your offering. But I want to pray for the offering. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you and worship. Lord, and we're going to worship right now. And, Lord, uh, our offering is worship to you. So use it, Lord God, for your glory, Lord, so that more people can know who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
We thank you, God, for this offering, Lord God. We thank you for this night. We thank you for your presence here. Now, Lord, seal this word in our hearts, Lord God. And help us, Lord, to be a light in this dark place as we leave, Lord God. Bring us back together this week in our life groups and in our prayer times, Lord God. Bring us back together safe and sound next Sunday. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Peace.